Kerry, thank you so much for joining me again on the Bodies Built Better podcast. Welcome back. Oh, thank you so much for having me back. I always joke around that I never know if I'm going to be coming back. That's a good <laughs> That's a good sign. I'm ready. So look, I'm double fisting. I got coffee in one hand <laughs> and then I got structured water in the other. Brilliant. So if you're watching on video, you'll see me mixing the <laughs> two together. So good. Well, last time we spoke about the lymphatic system and we're going to get into it today, but we're also going to talk about our organs, which I feel like is super important that we don't really talk about. So I'm excited yeah. to get back into that. But to start with, Doc, in 10 words or less, can you explain the lymphatic system? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's a good challenge. Is that a challenge or because what? Because it is because I usually spend 16 hours trying to tell <laughs> exactly. people what it is. <laughs> All right. Maybe more than yeah. 10 words. <laughs> well, how about this? I mean, just kind of like is an intriguing one. I tell people it's the number one system you're not taking care of to feel better. And then that usually after that usually says, well, what is it? And what does it do? Right. So um, actually just, I tell people it's the most important part, honestly, of your immune and cardiovascular system. And so that's, that's it. And, and it, it feeds into stuff we talked last time. And, and I teach all the time is that all the body systems that we have, they, they never work in isolation. They always work together. They're always trying to help each other. And when one doesn't work so well, another one really tries to help out as best it can, mm, you know? Exactly. And so I guess then going on from what you've just said in terms of our immune system, if it's not working, then what can happen? What do we see? What are our symptoms? Yeah, here's the interesting thing about the immune system. It can work too much or not enough. That's that's duality. That's yeah. everything in life. That's yes, no, right, wrong, up, down. There's always a flip side to something. So some people have an autoimmune issue where the immune system is overactive. And other ones, they have an underactive one where they're more vulnerable to a lot of different things, toxins, pathogens, whatever, right? And it's interesting because the, it's almost like stress that everybody says the word stress and automatically it's a bad word. Um, no, I mean, you need stress because without it, you'd actually die faster. That's the only way you become stronger and more resilient is through hardship. But that's what your immune system does too. I mean, everybody blames the immune system on stuff. First of all, it's always doing the best it can with what it's got in the moment it's in to help you survive a little bit longer. It doesn't mean it's always fun, the choices that it makes, but it becomes more resilient too the more it gets exposed to hardships or pathogens. And then it can take a little bit more as you go. But here's the flip side, though. Stress and the immune system always go together because excess stress has a tendency to cause an immune system response. And one of the ways that you can control your immune system is to control your stress response, right? It's an immun immunological, they call it neuroimmune response. You, you ha have a thought, the thought goes into the brain, then your brain runs away with the thought. And then all of a sudden the immune system responds to what you thought of the thought. <laughs> you, <laughs> exactly. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> Nothing's happened. You've just been thinking about something happening. Well, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happens. That's why the role of emotions are so critical in relationship to chronic pain and disease, because, you know, it's not what happened to you. It's what you think about what happened to you that does it, because something can happen to you and something can happen to me that's the exact same thing. And you're falling to pieces and I'm smiling over there. What what's the difference? It's not reality. The reality you paint in your own brain. And so you can choose to paint a different reality. It's not easy. Hmm. It doesn't mean that what you're looking at isn't real, um, right? This is like dipping down in the matrix time, red pill, blue <laughs> pill. But there's gonna come a point where when you've been sick long enough, I heard Mel Robbins say this recently that somebody caught her uh, having a coffee or something and it was a waiter and she put up their conversation having them on the fly and she said something that really hit me. 
there came a point when I realized I had to rescue myself. That ultimately it's going to come down to you and fighting for yourself or looking at things that you might not normally look at because you know, it seems crazy or illogical. And first of all, the human body is not logical, <laughs> yeah. at least in the way that we look at it, the human logic, because cosmic logic and quantum logic don't line up with what we think is logical. And that's where you can go down some crazy uh, pathways. But I love that point. You had to rescue yourself because no one should care more about your health than you do. Exactly. And it's, it's way too often that we leave it in someone else's hands. It's frightening how often we do that. Mm. We become a disempowered or empowered by somebody who is a co-creator of your life, which is an authority figure. Yeah. That's why you have to be very, very careful how you interact with uh, a client or a patient. If you're a practitioner, because what you say has massive impact on their progress. And then you've got to go in also when you're a practitioner and start, I mean, when you're a patient and start to be a little bit more aware of the, the words and phrases that people just throw around and how it begins to impact you. That's right. It's really, really super powerful. That's why I've really started to look at the power of language and words and uh, labels. And when I said thought, thought about the thought, like there, there are now, you know, more than ever, there's trigger words for people and uh, on any different thing. And in relationship to your health, there's a ton of them. Absolutely. And you're right. It's something that I'm concentrating on a lot as well in terms of my language when I'm talking to clients. And it's one that I get stumped with because, you know, they're like, oh, does it feel bad? I'm like, bad, but what is bad <laughs> and trying to get it around and and explain things in a way that gets them out of you know that sort of negative thinking and more of a broader I guess healthy sense is is hard to do at times it really is hard to do that's why people don't do it, it <laughs> yeah takes, that's it first of all it's the awareness that you should do it and yeah. then it's a lot of practice because you're going to find yourself defaulting back to words or phrases or things that you always do that you don't notice. That's because it's burrowed into your subconscious brain and it's neuroplastic. And then you have to stay on top of it. And the one thing I like about that is it, it was a great way for me to become more mindful and aware and present in the moment I'm in. So people tell you, you need to be more mindful. You need to be more aware. And we know that, but it's difficult to do. So I took it on as a challenge that let me just become more aware of how I'm feeling when something happens. And my first initial instinct when something happens, and then there's that space in between the stimulus and the response. And it's, it's there, but it's really small. And then when you start to play around with it and notice it, it begins to expand, right? And then with practice, uh, it took me, I'm going to not lie to you, it took me about six months. I mean, I had to really go at it and I was very frustrated, but I decided to make it a uh, ritual for me. And I started small. I put it in a context. So instead of trying to do that all over the place, all during the day, it was overwhelming. I said to myself this, I teach what's called TLOS, tiny little action steps, right? Little and often over the long haul. So my thing is now I tell people, I want you to TLOS yourself. And they're like, excuse me? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> and I said, allow you me to expand that. on that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing, honestly. <laughs> um, and I said, whenever I put it in context and I, and I got this idea from, uh, James Clear, who wrote one of my favorite books, Atomic Habits. And he said, you know, tie something that a habit that you have now to a a new habit that you want to establish because you're already there. So I said, anytime that I'm on social media is when I'm going to really start to practice this because that's an environment that you can get pulled in and triggered very quickly when you see a comment or a post that 
even if it just disagrees with yours, sometimes we don't even let that in anymore. We're so reflexively defensive. I said, notice what, how it makes you feel. Don't have a harsh reply reaction. All right. And even if you do write it down, but don't send anything and just take, take a moment. And it was so profound for me because what I noticed when I started to be more aware of that is that when I would read a comment, I noticed how my physiology would begin to change. My immune system actually began to change. I noticed my heart rate went up. I noticed that I would start to get almost allergic type reactions where my eyes would get a little uh, wet or teary or burning. And I just started to feel like I didn't want to feel. And I said, that's amazing. And that's not good. <laughs> you know? And I need to be able to take back control of that. And in time, I became empowered because I, I then got to a point where I would just like let it go or I would just hit delete and then it's gone, right? Because here's what I noticed that when I, when I would, reply something back, you know, that's the two energies hitting each other. And then for the rest of the day, you're looking to see what their <laughs> reply is to your yeah. reply and it's gone. Mm. But meanwhile, I could just hit delete and it's gone. Exactly. Right? Uh, it, it's really, really, it's a small thing, but it's a, it's a big thing. And that that's the important stuff when you're trying to change habits and behaviors and physiology is to think that, uh, Nonlinear relationships. That means that if you do something small on the front end, you get a, a huge change on the back end that, that you're like, how in the world did something so small make such a big difference in my life? That's nonlinear, but it also goes the other way where you can do a lot of big things in the front end, and then you get a really small thing on the back end. That's the universe telling you that size doesn't matter. That's what it's telling you is that small little things make huge impacts later. And that's also one of the reasons why therapies end up failing, in my opinion, because everybody throws the kitchen sink at you in the beginning and they hit you with 50 different great techniques that they learned like a sledgehammer. And then the body over here makes no change and you don't understand why. That's because you overwhelmed the system. Exactly. It doesn't even know what to do. And you didn't take the time to really think and look and listen and investigate what might be the small thing. So that's why in the beginning, I usually take a lot of time talking to and with an assessment before I do anything in the front end. And if I do, it's only a few things. And then I watch the response, especially the longer that you've been sick. The longer that you've been sick, the more you have to think as a practitioner, not do, think. That's different. Anybody can do. That's not hard. Thinking is hard. That's why you don't find many great practitioners, in my opinion. And then I, need you to, I need you to think not just with your mind, but I need you to think with your hands. That means that I need you to put your hands on the human being that's standing in front of you and watch the reactions and feel, feel the reactions, not necessarily the tissue. And it, that's a lost art in medicine today. I don't even know if anybody can give you a, a, a manual exam by hand anymore. Sometimes because they don't have the time, especially in the United States. I mean, we have a system that's broken where you have a very short period of time that you can spend with a client to actually get to know the client or assess an area that doesn't that they're not complaining of mm. <laughs> right exactly and there's yeah there's so many times where you know as a massage therapist I'll be working with someone and um you know even that anticipation of something will hurt or how they protect themselves and <laughs> you haven't really put your hands on them yet I mean it's all it's all feedback and it's all really important to know. Yeah, that's huge. So if, if that already tells right there, if somebody's already afraid for you to touch them, you know one thing. Their nervous system, their immune system is in a heightened fight, flight, freeze, freak out response. And your first goal is to get that down and 
that doesn't happen a lot of times through more stimulation. It comes down through less or targeted stimulation, right? It, that's a that's a big key right there because I if it's very going to be very difficult to make a change in somebody's nervous system if the nervous system is in fight defense mode because its goal is to not let you in to do anything. That's right. I will run and keep running. <laughs> yeah, and it'll keep doing it because it's a very useful strategy. Absolutely. <laughs> I, <laughs> It's actually really smart. It just gets stuck there sometimes. Exactly. And see, I, what I try to tell people is that when you have stuff for a long time, you start to feel broken. You start to feel dysfunctional, which I freaking hate that word. Um, and you feel like your body's you know, turning on yourself. But everything that's happening to you right now, your body is doing because it, it believes that it's useful it's getting something out of what it's doing. There's no oopsie daisy accidents in the body, right? And there's a utility to everything. But what's the utility? Making sure that you don't die and you don't suffer as much as you could, because trust me, you can, right? And then here's the thing, it gets caught in that. And maybe it's no longer the most useful for you. But at one point it was, because the body's very, it, it, it wants to get into a point where it doesn't have to think anymore. That's the goal. That's the habits and the subconscious. Because if you had to think about everything you're doing all the time, your brain would explode in 10 seconds because it can't take the stimulus. So it just goes back to patterns that worked for it in the past, whether you think they're right or wrong. So it says, okay, last time when this happened to me, I sent a lot of pain to Perry's back because it forced him to stop moving when he did too much. So guess what happens? When you do too much again, the brain's going to go, hey, guys, I remember what we did. Let's hit the back. And that's what it's going to do. And it'll get it'll build in there. And then sometimes you'll expect it to happen consciously. Right. That's the, the loop that it gets in. So that's one of the reasons why you have to give it alternatives. You have to give it options because the brain needs in order for you to change anything. You need contrast because you don't have a choice until you know you have one. I really want you to think about that one. You don't know you have a choice until you know you have one. Otherwise, you're just going to keep doing the same thing because there's no other choice. <laughs> so that's why when people have pain somewhere, I go somewhere else because they, they focus on another place. They focus on a B, not the A. Focusing on the A is easy. I need you to find a B because when you find a B, you pay a lot less attention to A. And then now your brain says, hey, you know what we have now? Now we have an option. Now we have an alternative. And then that's the way you can make a huge change in the software yeah. of the body. That, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's frustrating as a, a massage therapist. I mean, there's a lot of education that has to come into it, you know, between client and practitioner, but you know, they're always like, my neck hurts, just work my neck. <laughs> Right. Like, no, 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 no. Is you are more than your neck. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, right. It's, uh, well, that's a proverbial. Can you rub my traps? <laughs> Every husband in the world knows that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, yeah, that's what happens. You know, you reflexively go for the area that's the, yeah, that hurts the tightest or the most painful. Mm. And now, here's what I use to try to tell body workers: is you need to. With your skill set, with what you can do with your hands, you can't get cookie cutter with your application for it. And then, so you need to base where you start and what you do on the human being that's in front of you. And even if it's the same human being for visit three, doesn't mean you still start the same way because they're going to be different each day based on the context of the day that they've had. Right? Because there's sometimes that I have a client who is different than they were before because maybe they just lost their job 18 hours prior, you know, and the, so the system changes. So where I start, it's very interesting. So let's say, you know, you have somebody with a massage and, uh, you know, a lot of times we typically start them when they're face down most of the time, right? But you should assess the whole body, you know, ask them where they're feeling tension, but manually assess the whole body just with some light touch. So you get to sense and feel tension and tightness on both sides, back and front. 
And then you can notice the area of the body that might have the most pain or that might have the most vulnerability to it. What I mean by that is this, is that the area that needs the most work might not be the most physically painful, but it's the one that their nervous system shows you they don't want you to be near. So for instance, if your neck hurts, but I go down in your right hip and then I notice your body starts to show me signs of more stress or tension, or it's trying to flee a little bit. And you just develop that in time. But you know, in any way, every human being is innately endowed with the ability to see if somebody is uncomfortable or wants to get away or doesn't like something, because that's based on your survival. So, you, you know, they don't hurt you. And you find out where the biggest place is. But here's what I tell people, don't start there. Because what happens is that that might be too much for them in the beginning. So you start somewhere else. Maybe you start just a little bit close to where it is. And then you tiptoe your way in. It's just like a relationship. If I meet you for the first time, I'm not going to jump up six inches from your face and start talking to you. Because what's going to happen? You're going to say, dude, too much, too fast, too soon. <laughs> you're kicking me out. Step <laughs> off. Yeah. Right? And it's the same thing with the body. You have, to, you have to let it grant you permission to come in. And that's like, I'm getting to know you, right? I'm coming in closer, my body language, all that sort of stuff. And you need to put that also in the context of working with the body. So you don't always dive into ground zero because diving into ground zero freaks out the nervous system, right? And if you just make a small, that's, that's a nonlinear approach. That means a small little thing can make a huge difference. And then you just start from that area around it and kind of come on in. And then you work from there based on what you, uh, what you see. Yeah. There's a few quotes. Well, actually, there's a lot of quotes of yours that, <laughs> that I love. I won't say all of them today. Um, but if you could elaborate on these two, which I really love, and it wasn't until oh boy. I heard this second okay. one, oh. I'll go with the first one. That is, okay. you can't regenerate if you can't eliminate. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So good. Sometimes I get nervous with my <laughs> quotes. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I, I can do one. Yeah. Please explain. Okay. So let's talk about those words anyway. Okay. So if you can't regenerate, if you can't eliminate. So eliminate means I want you to be able to get rid of waste products from the body. Right. If you think about it, that's what most of your body is designed for, to get rid of stuff, eliminate things, toxins, waste. So you've got your organs, they're big. Your lungs have to eliminate carbon dioxide and toxins. It's one of the largest detoxification organs in your body. And nobody looks at the lungs until you can't breathe. Yeah. That's too I'm little. I'm good at breathing late. for some reason. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, and, and then you've got your, your, your pee, your poop, your, your kidney, your colon, you got sweat, also your nostril and your eyes. I mean, you leak out of all these different orifices trying to get rid of stuff. Right? How gross are we? <laughs> well, we're kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, because I think about it this way. It, nature's really smart. They give us yeah. so many different ways to eliminate toxins and waste that if something goes wrong with one system, another one takes over. So you might not notice an issue for a long period of time. And you probably won't because the body is designed to be very strong and tough and resilient. And it can take a lot before it lets you know it's falling apart. Right? And so uh, it's doing its job. So the first thing I look at is the elimination part. And then you have regeneration. Right? So let's say that every day you're supposed to make new cells so you don't die. That's <laughs> Okay. That's called regeneration. So stuff dies every day on you as it should. And then your body says, oh, I'm going to make new cells. That's called regeneration. But all of those cells that die normally, they're pre-programmed to die. That's also waste. So you're waste to yourself. Now, now what happens if you can't get that waste out through those systems that we talked about before well you just gather more waste right and then you have to regenerate if you get hurt or if you get injured and you get inflammation which you're supposed to get so just like stress inflammation isn't bad 
inflammation is good. No inflammation, you die way faster, my friend. So you want it. It's called pro-inflammatory. The body sends everything there. Guess what it sends there? Immune system goes there because it's going to try to attack things and kill things and surround things. And you get a lot of swelling and edema and heat. Smart play. Thank you very much. But then it crosses over to another phase of inflammation, which is the elimination phase where once it gets inflamed, then you start to regenerate because you, you, you got to get rid of the cells that just got hurt and you have to make new ones. So all those cells have to get out too. And how do they get out? Same damn way everything else does. Like whatever you stick in your mouth has to get out. Whatever you injure in your knee has to get out and they go out the same pathways. Right. So that's why a lot of people who have immune system elimination issues get joint pain issues. They get muscle pain issues because it settles in another tissue because these systems work together. They're all together. So here's what happens is that in my way, I look at things. It's going to be impossible for you to regenerate anything if you can't get rid of the waste that you have coming into your body all the time or that's stuck in there. Because you're going to be, it's, it's like having a container that you just keep putting a lot of stuff in that can't get out. And then eventually you're going to swell that container. That's what the body does. So if you have a lot of toxins and waste in your system that can't get out, your body has to say, oh, what the hell? What are, what are we going to do here? We have to protect ourselves so we don't get sick and we don't die faster. What's a strategy? Well, one, it can swell you up and make you more puffy. So it tries to surround the toxins through more liquid, more inflammation, more water retention around the cells. It tries to dilute the waste that's sticking in there. And it also will make you fatter and heavier because it, it accumulates fat to take in toxins and surround toxins to keep it away from the more vital structures in the center that can kill you quick. So it says, I'm going to put more junk in your trunk and around your waist. So we don't destroy your uh, intestines or your kidney or your liver, right? It's just a safety net strategy for the body to do. And when you get so much inflammation around the tissues, the fluid that surrounds the cells is called interstitial fluid. So you're living in mostly liquid, right? I think you look at reason you're like 70, 80, 90% water. I just want you to know you're more than 10%. So it's a lot. All right. And so that's a fluid filled environment. And if it becomes too toxic, you become inflamed because the liquid can't move right? It's actually called the term, it's called interstitial inflammatory stasis. That's a big fancy word that means the fluid that surrounds your cells is stagnant. That's what stasis means. It means it doesn't move because it's backed up from the lymph and the veins, and then blood flow can't even come in because there's too much pressure. And then you've developed this wonderful thing called inflammation because now your body has to attack all the stuff that can't get out of the fluid that lives around the cells. And you're not going to be able to reach. Why in the hell would your body put new cells in an environment that's toxic? It's like, think of this. If you had a toxic environment at home, would you want anybody to move in with you? I mean, I wouldn't want to go in there either. So you, your, your cells are the same, in, in my opinion. So all I want to do is let me try to get the waste out. And then I worry about the front end on the supply side. And I think we talked about this last time is that your body needs nutrients in order to make new cells. A lot of them, right? But mostly it needs uh, glucose, oxygen, minerals, protein. Those are some big ones. And most people don't even have those. Right? Or they, they overwhelm the supply side and take about $10,000 worth of supplements at one shot. <laughs> yeah. That's the nonlinear mistake I told you about before. Who the hell said you got to take 50? Why is that better? How about you just take one? And then, because if, if you put 50 in, you have to absorb those. If you're too toxic, you can't absorb them. Same thing. Got to go easy, right? So everybody's building in and going in on the supply side, and they're not getting better. 
And I'm like, I, all I want you to do is think duality. If whatever you're doing right now isn't working, try the exact opposite. And that means try to focus on the elimination side first. Then you go on the supply side, right? It's almost like working with martial arts. You can be combative and confrontational, or you can do the internal martial arts, which is the flow state where I kind of use your energy against you. And then I don't have to do much work. That's the same thing with the with the body does that make sense how it totally does yeah i mean you've just basically said the second quote that i was gonna say and that was drainage oh, precedes supply and it wasn't until oh yeah that i heard that quote that i'm just like oh so <laughs> that's why my probiotics aren't hurting aren't helping i actually have to <laughs> you know, fix my gut, get rid of stuff before I get put in the good stuff. And um, that one was a huge one for me. So yes, yeah, that's actually from sense. the world of osteopathic medicine. I'd love to take credit for that one. But ah. the, they have a quote that when I was starting to study the lymphatic system many years ago, one of the only places you could find any resources on it was looking at osteopathic medicine, particularly the classics, the traditional, the old school. Because they've, they've veered away from traditional osteopathic medicine in the United States. They're more like medical doctors. And Andrew Taylor still, who was the founder of osteopathic medicine, talked about the lymphatic system a lot back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This cat was way ahead of his time. And they, I saw those three words. And, you know, they can take a, a subject that's complicated and complex. I wouldn't say complicated. I'd say complex. Com complicated is not the same as complex. Uh, see, that's me watching my words. Um, yes. <laughs> and I said, they put it in three words, drainage precedes supply. And it's exactly what I just told you. Just make sure the drainage pathways are there uh, before you go on the supply side. And that really sparked my whole journey, Jackie, into looking at not just the therapies that I choose to do with somebody, but more importantly, uh, the order that I choose to do them in and how I, how many I choose to do at the same time, because, uh, that makes a huge difference on something. So let me explain if I can for a moment, let's say that, you know, you have five of your favorite therapies that you want to do on somebody. Well, one, it doesn't mean you do all five at one time. I think we established that, but all five of those, if you do them in different order, makes a difference on the outcome, even though they're the same five things, because in physiology, when you do a stimulus, right, a stimulus is a signal and then your body, your systems have to respond to the signal and then they give you an output, the so input interpretation output, right? So when you change the input, you completely change the interpretation and the output from the ingredient. So let's say I have ingredient A and I do, let's say it's um, a heat pack. I'm going to put heat as here and then my tissues respond to heat and then I get the output. Then my B, so that happens. And then I'll do my B where let's say I go in there and I do like ultrasound, right? Whatever, right? that how well the ultrasound works depends on what happened with a you follow because ultrasound has to react to what a did now if i switch those around i did ultrasound first it's completely different outcome because your input a is going to be a different stimulus that you did first and then if i do my heat second it's going to be a drastically different thing. And you're saying, I don't understand that it doesn't make sense. No, it makes perfect sense because it's not the same thing. It's, it's what your body does with them that makes a difference on how well they work. That's how physiology works. That's why I have to watch reactions to everything that I do. And I always equate it to a metaphor of making a recipe. I don't know if I did this last time, but let's say you want to make a cake, right? or a recipe, you have all these ingredients, right? And then you've got them listed and you're going, okay. Now, very rarely have I ever seen any recipe that just has one step that <laughs> says, throw everything in a bowl at once and mix it up and then cook it. 
I have, it's cold toast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but what happens is that you see all these steps and it looks, oh my God, why are they doing it this way? And they say, okay, I want you to take these three ingredients and mix them up into a small bowl here. Then take these two and mix them up over here. And now take those and put them together. And you don't question that at all. You're just like, what? Why am I doing that? It's the same ingredients. No, 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 it's not. Because you change the relationship between the ingredients, which change the reaction. It's the same thing with therapy. So if it's important enough to break things down into steps when you make a cake, it's important enough to do it <laughs> in relationship to your Human. therapy. <laughs> Absolutely. That was and the, that's how you got to experiment. And that's how you got to play. That's why it comes yeah. down to the individual, because everybody latches on to their favorite technique and the dirty little secret is every technique works for someone right but what you have to do is you have to think concepts first because here's the rub your techniques are based on your concepts so the only way you're going to change your outcome is not to change your technique you can but if you got the wrong concept what's a big concept for me drainage precedes supply which means if you don't get that right, I don't care how many damn techniques you do, you're not going to get the results that you want because you're going down the wrong pathway in the wrong direction. And then maybe sometimes that's not the answer. So how do I know? Oh, I'm going to do it and see what my outcomes are. So it's not a good outcome or a bad outcome. It's a, it's an information-based outcome. It's the body saying, Hey man, that was freaking awesome. Let's do that again. I'm glad you stepped back and you started to think a little bit, or it's going to say this time you didn't get it, but don't give up. Go back. Think, think a little bit. I don't like to use the word better either. Think different. Think different. I hate the word. I hate the word better. I like the word different. Um, and then you might get the answer. So I, I learned something from a friend of mine and I called Boyd Varty, who I had on my podcast. And he's a, actual lion tracker in South Africa. And he's, he learned one of the skills from a tracker that taught him and it's called the path of not here, which means that when you go down a pathway and you don't find the lion or you get off track, don't get upset. Don't get frustrated. It's called the path of not here. You just learned where it's not. And where it's not. Oh, that's great. And, and what you have to do is stop, take a look around and uh, become, observe the signs and the signals and then walk backwards until you can now find a new pathway to go on. So when people come to see me, they've been down a lot of pathways and they're very frustrated and they're upset. And I actually reframe it. And I say, first of all, what you've done up to this point is fantastic because mm. you've seen a lot of great people. You tried a lot of things, you know, and you ruled out things that, you know, it's not. So that's the path of not here. So now what we do is I'm not going to revisit the same track. I'm going to go down a different track and that's the drainage precedes supply. one. So it takes the pressure off of them on beating themselves up or being frustrated with a system that can't find something even though you know it's there that's because they're going down the same concept pathway trying to force it and you have to think vastly different at that standpoint and in, in order to find where you need to be but i really want to hit that home because it's an important concept for people that the longer you've been sick you know the more you kind of fall into the abyss i know i've been there but you need to think about um, what you've done so far and what you've ruled out. I call it the check the boxes off. <clears throat> and then we just move to the next one. Yeah, super important. Let's talk about our organs. I mean, I know we have. Um, oh, yeah. Where do we start? Because I feel like I mean, we, I feel like the basis of our knowledge around organs is that they do stuff and when they're not doing stuff well, it means we can't poo properly or our sugar levels are 
crap and you know diabetes and all these things we we that's kind of like the base level of our knowledge around organs what should yeah. we know I mean, first of know all that you got question. them <laughs> first of all that you got them <laughs> check yeah let's, let's hope you got them you know some you can live without some you yeah. can't right but the awareness that they they're really really important it's kind of out of sight out of mind you know, we don't really think about the organs when we have pain we because most of the time your organs uh you don't actually feel a lot of pain in your organs per se. exactly now, why is that well because if you have pain in your organs that's some of the worst pain you're ever going to feel in your life anybody who's had appendicitis or diverticulitis or crohn's disease right or you get uh swelling in your spleen or one of the ultimate organ pains is a freaking heart attack right hey that pain is freaking awful it'll bring you to your knees so that what that means to me is that in order to avoid that pain your body will will try to protect you from that as long as it can as best as it can so it sends pain everywhere else first uh, it'll send it to your muscles. It'll send it to your joints. It'll send it to your fascia because it's trying to protect you from the organs. Because listen, you're going to suffer either way. There's no way around not suffering. That's just going to happen in the human condition. But your body has to make a choice. Well, why in the hell is it going to make you suffer more when it doesn't have to? That's just stupid. You're going to die faster. So it throws the rest of the body under the bus, mostly the musculoskeletal system. So a lot of people who come in to see me have what they call referred pain pain in areas that are actually coming from underlying irritation and organs or poor mo mobility motility function in the organs because the organs have to move to a ton they move in and of themselves they move around other organs and they have to move the body so think about this way when you bend and you touch your toes your organs have to slip slide over each other underneath your diaphragm and your rib cage in order for you to touch your toes now, you're, people think of the diaphragm and the body is it's a muscle, but they see pictures of it and it's all hollow because they only show you the picture of the diaphragm. You're jammed in there like sardines, man. You're, you're, you've got stuff stuck up to the top of that diaphragm, one of them being your liver and your stomach. You're, they actually poke through the damn thing. So if you're stuck in the motion and movement of your liver because maybe your liver has inflammation or it's stagnated or it's backed up or you have irritation in your stomach because you have high stress you have low stomach acid whatever and then you bend over to touch your toes and those organs don't glide over each other you're not touching your toes because you can't force past it but you maybe you can force past it but you overstress the tissue the muscle and the fascia and you can end up getting hurt then the organs are really important because um think about where they're located right and, and so you you've got the lungs in the front and they're protected by armor so they have the rib cage here but the vast amount of your organs have no armor they're in the front exposed to everything right so whenever you twist turn and move or, or open yourselves up that's a massive vulnerability in the organs so one of the things that i do for everyone is i do an organ assessment one i look at your history like if you ever been to a doctor and you have their systems checklist and they say have you ever had this 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 right and it's usually under a category for an organ or a system. Well, the more you check those off, the more I know your organs are probably a hot mess, right? Because you, you checked off more symptoms. Um, and then if you've had any surgeries whatsoever around your torso in front, I know we're gonna have organ issues because it's got scar tissue. But then I'm gonna do an assessment where I'm gonna put my hand on the abdomen and I'm just going to feel the tissue, but more importantly, I'm going to watch your reaction to me putting my hand on your abdomen. And most people don't like it because the body is already telling you, oh boy, this is not going to be fun because this guy knows. And then I start to dig in there and then I, I sense it, I feel it. 
and you just move things around in there. It's just like I would assess your back or your shoulder or, you know, your lumbar spine. You press in there and you feel the tissue and you look and see how well mobility is. And I do the same thing for the organs. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time I find an issue there. One, because nobody's ever looked there. But two, I found in Eastern medicine, there's a correlation to emotions and organs. So, uh, you know, human beings, we, we have emotions. That's what makes us not rocks for human beings. And there's always an emotional component to pain all the time. And you'll store recessed emotions or suppressed emotions, repressed emotions, whatever word you want to use. You're just, you're putting them aside sometimes subconsciously or consciously and they stick in the organ. So for instance, the anger is tied a lot to the uh, liver. So if you look around the world today, I think everybody's got a liver problem because everybody's <laughs> exactly. angry. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And then you got fear that's tied to the kidneys. And anger and fear are on the same resonant frequency. So a lot of people are angry because they're scared to death. So liver and kidneys usually go together. The lungs hold sorrow and grief a lot. So those areas that I can, I can put my hands on and be able to sense what's going on and watch the reaction. And they also can correspond to chakra points from Ayurvedic medicine, where the, the abdomen region will always res respond as a safety area. So the abdomen is a safety response and anything from the abdomen down is a safety reaction to something. And the, the heart uh, chakra in the center here around the sternum, that's the, that's the love spot, but it's also because the heart's there. Also the grief and sorrow spot, you know, kind of the heartache place that you have. And then from the throat up here, the throat and the chakra ones a lot is not being able to express your true nature or who you are or feeling like you don't have a voice, which a lot, a lot of that's happening in the world today. And then the same up into the eyes, stuff where people here in the head and neck where you've seen something or don't want to see something and it can manifest in those particular regions, right? And then that's how I start the look at the body. And one of the number one things that I try to teach people is this concept. You, Y-O-U, capital letters, Y-O-U, can't change something until you become aware of it. Okay? The, things are always changing, whether you're aware of it or not. That's just life. But the operative word of you, if you want to influence it, it's that back to that choice part, right? So with the organs, I just want people to start to know that they're important, start to feel around in the abdomen, and then start to do a little massage around in the abdomen yourself. Because everybody has a right to massage their own abdomen. Don't let anybody tell you any different. It's, but I can, it's really interesting to me, Jackie, how many people get freaked out when you go start to work around the throat, the uh, abdomen or the sternum in two ways. One, they visibly get uncomfortable because they're very vulnerable areas. But two, even in the healthcare field, people get scared to death to touch the abdomen. I'm like, what the hell are you scared for? It's just like any other thing. It's just on the front side. Like they're scared they're going to touch something wrong and, and make something worse. I mean, do you realize how much abuse your organs have had to go through your whole life without you even paying attention to them? That's they're right. pretty tough in there. So, yeah. you know, don't be so timid. Don't be so scared. Just know that you need to start to go in there and move them around. And this is when they say, which way should I move them? And here's my easy answer. Yes. <laughs> like, how about everywhere? Because when you twist and you turn and you bend and you extend and you squat and you throw, guess what's way they're moving? Everywhere. Everywhere. Right? There's, there's no magic vector that you need to go in. You just yeah. work them all. It's the same thing with tissue work. People say, which way does the fascia run? Yeah. So <laughs> just, just work a starburst. Look, work, work like a compass, right? Yeah. Just go in all in all directions and you'll start to free it up. Mm. The stuff really is not difficult, right? It, honestly, it's just the awareness that you need to go there and trust your instincts and start to work it and don't be so fearful of your body and of doing something right or wrong. There's just different. 
It's just results. One of the things that I think that I have a big problem with medicine is that it's very fear based and guilt based, which I mean, they make you scared to do anything that on yourself or to yourself that they can't tell you you have permission to do. And if you do, they make you feel guilty about it. What the hell kind of foundation is that to build on strength and resilience of the human body, right? So people message me all the time, Doc, can I come to your workshop? I'm, I'm not a professional. Can I understand? I'm like, listen, if you're breathing and you, know, you have a pulse, you're good to go to my class, man, because it's designed for all human beings. I just take complicated subjects and make them simple. And I replace labels and words, which is what's been profound for me. We get intimidated by a word that sets us off and sometimes you go into a state of it's a complicated word i've never seen before so you turn off your learning ability you know so let's say for instance i'm i'm talking about the uh interstitial fluid and you're like interstitial is just a freaking word that somebody made up so all i want you to call it now is your bathtub so your bathtub is backed up or your toilet's backed up it's the same concept. I don't care if you call it interstitial or bathtub. I just want, just because you know the word doesn't mean you know what you're doing. Exactly. I, I need you to make sure that you know what to do with the bathtub when it's not working well. And then they go, oh, well, yeah, that's simple. I know, I know it is. Don't let them intimidate you by complicated language. Because listen, if I went to a mechanic and he said, well, you have this rocker arm thingy, whatever, you know, because he could tell, I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> And then I say, uh, I don't know anything about car, whatever, do what you got to do. But if I call that rocker thingy thing, you know, like a spatula, you'd be like, oh, okay, dude, you, you need to fix how my spatula, you know, works with my fork, that kind of thing. So, yeah. And so I make it a joke, but it's not a joke because that, yeah. that's how simple it really is. Yeah. A lot of people just feel immobilized because medicine takes complex things and they make it complicated. Yeah. And that's why and I love your wrong. work. It's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I had, oh, I'm doing more of this visceral stuff and it just blows my mind how incredible it is. And one of the things that I love is that you can get a, you can get a direct response. And for example, there's, there is an incidence that I'm thinking about and that's where, you know, we did some work around the liver and then shoulder pain was gone. Yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, they're like mind blown. So can you explain that a little bit, how um, how it's so interconnected in that way? Sure. So let me give you our medicine things. I call it viscerosomatic reflex. Viscerosomatic muscular reflex. Basically, that means when something's going on with your organs, you can feel it anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that, that's what that means. Cause everything is interconnected, right? It, yeah. It's, it's a one big ball of messed up yarn. I call it <laughs> right. It, you can't separate the systems in the body. No system works alone, never gets in alone, never heals alone. So the liver correlates to the right shoulder a lot. And then the stomach usually can correspond to the left shoulder, but it can also, the, the liver can also mess with the left shoulder. Why? Here's because the body can do whatever the hell it wants and it doesn't have to explain exactly. itself to you at all. Like the body said, I don't care if you understand why I did what I did. That's on you, man. I'm just doing what I'm doing. So if those things from a logical standpoint, right? Just simply, let's say you want to raise your right arm up over your head, right? And if you're not driving, you're listening, you can do that right now. What, what does your right rib cage have to do? It has to be able to elevate and then also lift up a little. It's got to have mobility to it. And then what about all the stuff up underneath there? Right? So if I lift up like this, my rib cage elevates up, which means I, my liver goes down in relationship to that. It's still going up with the rib cage, but it goes up slower than the rib cage. So it's actually going down. All right. What happens if the, the liver is stuck up against the diaphragm? here and then you raise your arm up well you don't really feel the restriction here because you're still going to move your arm up and it might be a small little difference so maybe five percent but five percent 
over five years jacks up your shoulder at some point to where you're like, all I did was reach for the coffee cup and then my shoulder went. That's what that happens. OK, I'm not concerned about you reaching for the coffee cup. I'm concerned about the 5000 or 50,000 reaches you did prior. Right. And then you'll move your shoulder up, but you're going to be taking it a little bit more from the trap, a little bit more from the neck. So you're going to lift that shoulder up a little bit. And then on my right trap, ah, it's always tight. Can you rub my right trap? Sure. But lie on the table because I'm going to stick my fingers in your liver first. And then I'm going to see what happens. And then people go, ow, that's really tender yeah. in there. And I can scoop down on the liver. I can do what's called a rib cage pump. I can just move it. And it's like rebounding on your rib cage and then free that area up. And then I'm like, okay, now raise your arm up over your head. And then they go, what the, <laughs> Exactly. that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Right. And because here's the, here's the thing. People may be thinking of the fascia that's there, which you should. Mm. But I got news for you. The fascia also wraps around the liver. So you, the liver is also a component because you can have more than one problem. You could have a rib cage that doesn't move that well. You could have a tight oblique on your right side, but don't forget the liver up underneath. I want you to envision and visualize the layers of the body that you have. And then now stop thinking rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, obliques. I want you to start to think, the organs that sit up underneath and then hang on for it. Not only that, but all of the fluid flow that sits with the organs, which is where the primary blood flow in blood flow out and lymph flow sits right in the abdomen. So you influence all the systems when an organ has an uh, issue to it. And then maybe you're heading something off. It could have been a bigger problem later because stuff that doesn't move stagnates. And you, you breed what? Inflammation. So the moral of the story is move your organs. That's why you breathe. When you breathe through the diaphragm, you're supposed to move your organs. But people say, ah, I do diaphragm breathing all the time. I'm like, that's great. But did you massage your organs first? No. Well, then we go back to what did I say before? The order in which you do things matter on how well it works. So in my world, you don't breathe through your diaphragm until you move your organs first. Then you breathe. You're going to get a different experience. Trust me. Doc, this has been sensational. <laughs> I know you have to leave, but I could talk to you for hours and hours. We'll come back. We'll do another we'll one. We'll come back for sure. If people want to find out more about you and your work and do a course, where can they find you? Oh, thank you very much. It's really easy. You just go to stopchasingpain.com and then that'll branch you out to all of our outlets. We're on social media, probably spend most of my time on Instagram. That's my favorite platform. But you can also see we have available up there videos and courses and memberships. And you can learn a lot of different things depending on how many rabbit holes you want to go down and how deep exactly. you want to get into it. Yeah, you know, we, we always have some online webcast uh, every month where we teach people um, that they can tune in for and then some self-help things you can do easily pardon me <clears throat> easily uh on your own right but yeah we'd love to see you there brilliant thank you so much doc really appreciate thank you it. i had a great time as always Jackie. as always it's great work 